Father, Lord, we ask now that you would minister to us through the power of your word, Lord, and, and that our hearts would be open to what it is that you have for us. Lord, I pray that you would also, um, Lord, bring healing in the lives of, of our church family that are uh, really battling with illness. Lord, I think of Anthony and Laura Jimenez and, and uh, his mom. We thank you for the work that they are, that you are doing in their lives. And Lord, uh, we just pray that you would heal her, Lord, and touch her and, and uh, strengthen her body. We pray also, Lord, for uh, Cipriano, Lord, and, and um, as his dad is uh, still battling, Lord, and, and both these people in the hospital, we pray, God, that you would just touch them and heal them. Lord, be with them. And, um, and Father, we, we think of uh, Michelle's family, Lord, um, our dear sister, and uh, Uncle Mike, as, we, as I know him, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, touch and heal his body as well, Lord. And, and there, are, there are others, Lord. I think of our, our friends out there in Durango, Mexico, Lord, uh, with Pastor Jay, we pray that you would be with them and, and uh, just watch over them and keep them all healthy and strong as they have some church family members that are uh, also dealing with illness. And so, God, we, we know that you have a plan in all of this. And we're just, we want to intercede, Lord. We want to pray. And we also pray, Lord, that you would uh, just guide and lead us now at this time. We love you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So um, before we get into the Bible study, I just wanted to say, hey, guys, to, no, so here, all, all you men, all right, all the men of Hope Alive Church, listen, um, make sure your ringer is on and that you answer the phone when you see Pastor George call because, um, you know, we're going to just see what we can do to, you know, get as many guys to come together. We have a, um, a church family member. Uh, she's in the middle of moving, and so he's going to be giving you a call, and, and hopefully, you know, that's also going to... Uh, be a great time of ministering to our church family, but also uh, have, have some fellowship time as well, all right? So I just wanted to throw that out there. And um, there's so much more too, but I want to get into the word with you guys, all right? So Revelation chapter number 22, in the name of Jesus, let's open up our Bibles, all right? So guys, how many of you, listen, how many of you are, are um, like, think of goals, right? Now, goals, and when I'm talking about goals, it's like, you know, those things that you think of in the future, and you kind of set your mind to it, and that's a goal in life, right? Now, um, now, listen, goals are, are very good, and, and I think one of the things about setting a goal for our own personal life is that it really, um, they, 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 those, those goals, they motivate us, you know, to, to endure the journey. They, those goals motivate us to continue and not give up, right? And some of those goals, you know, there's, we all have goals, like whether it be a goal of education, um, goals and, and relationships, right? Relationship goals. You ever see those, right? Uh, financial, right? Uh, a goal in, in just like whether it's saving money for a certain, like a vacation or, or a car or something like that. You know, those are all goals. And, you know, I think of sport teams, right? Athletic teams, all like baseball teams, football teams, they all have a goal of, um, you know, winning a championship, there's also goals of, you know, uh, physical fitness, right? People want, man, I have a goal. I want to, you know, we usually see those goals start at the, the beginning of a year, right? Well, we all have goals. Now, the goals that I just mentioned right now, you know, physical fitness, education, financial, and, and all that stuff, you know, um, th those aren't bad, you know? And none of these goals, which I mentioned, they're, they're, all, they're all good, right? They're, they're, they're good goals, but, you know, they don't... You know, really necessarily all come easy, right? There's a um, there's there's dedication that you need to set in it, right? Well, but the reality is of all these goals, guys, is that these goals are temporal, right? Like let's just say a goal of a championship or even education or financial. Again, those aren't bad, but they're they're temporal in the sense of they're just here, right? What is it that God? you know, wants us to do, I think for us as Christians, our major goal as, as believers in Jesus Christ is, man, my goal is to get to heaven, right? My goal is to be with Jesus, right? And, but these other goals that I mentioned, they, they can be good illustrations, if you will, of our spiritual life 
as Christians, right? Kind of examples or illustrations. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, for us to set a goal, let's just say it's a goal of like physical fitness or something like that. You know, we just don't go and buy, you know, um, buy a bunch of weights and some, you know, workout clothes and think that, okay, I'm doing it all. No, you have to put the work in, right? You got to go and you have to get up early. You have to watch what you eat. There's, you know, all of that dedication and commitment and even sacrifice that goes into that, right? Because you have a goal. Well, spiritually speaking, our goal is, again, to be in heaven. And there is a lot of things that we do here on earth to really attain that goal. Now, we don't get to heaven on our own works. I want to make sure that we all know that. We don't get to heaven um, because of what we do or, or anything like that. We get to heaven simply because of what Jesus has done for us and our confession and our, our confession that we confess our sin and we repent of our sin. Right. And, and so, um, but again, these, these goals that we all have, you know, does require sacrifice. It's a lifestyle, really. You know, we think of a lifestyle or or our practice. And you guys have heard me say this before that as, as Christians, right. It's, it's not just a religion. It's not just something that we say, you know, I say I'm a Christian. I'm really, what I'm saying is that my life style, how I live my life, how I practice my life is a desire to, to please the Lord and everything that I do. And so that's our practice or that's our lifestyle, right? And that's my, my goal. My end goal is to be with Jesus, right? And I'm determined in that direction. When we have goals, basically there's like a determination to live a certain way and to live in a certain direction. And again, as I mentioned, our ultimate goal as Christians is heaven, eternity, right? The pure presence of God. The title of today's message, guys, is our destination is our motivation, okay? Our destination is our motivation. So again, getting to heaven is not based upon my merit or anything that I have done. It's all based upon what Jesus has done and my confession, my, me confessing my sin and asking Jesus, right? And now, now that I know that I have a promise of heaven, that destination, now I am motivated. At least we ought to be. You know, at least I ought to be, right? I, I desire to be motivated to live as if I'm going to one day be in the pure presence of Jesus, right? And, you know, in other words, like that's where I'm from, right? I, I want, you know, that's my mindset. My mindset is, is to be in the eternal presence of God and I want to just be there. And so my life ought to be reflecting that and my, my, uh, my end goal, if you will, or my motivation to live my life as a reflection of, of being there in heaven. And in chapter number 22, this is what we're seeing. Guys, this is the last chapter in the book of Revelation. And this is, man, I was just, I was reading through this chapter a few times and it's, it's amazing. It's, uh, I just can't, you know, my mind is like, man, we're going to be in heaven. Like it's all going to be brand new, a new heaven, a new earth, the new Jerusalem, the presence of God, you know, and, and, and this is what we're going to be looking at here today. Again, all of the Bible, you know, all of scripture culminates, right, in the book of Revelation and, and bringing to the, you know, as I mentioned before, it's, it's all here. It's like, you know, the, the ultimate story end, right? The ultimate end of a story. We all live happily ever after in the presence of a holy God, right? And, and that's what we're going to be seeing here today. Okay, but let's look at some motivations about heaven, about the presence of heaven and what we're going to be doing in heaven. I want to read chapter 22, um, verses 1 through 5. This is what it says. Then the angel, now this angel will be the same angel, um, I, I believe the same angel that, that was talking to the apostle John in chapter number 21. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Some of your translations might say the pure river. 
Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Verse 3. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb of God will be in it. Man, that's some, underline that part in your Bible, okay? Um, please, underline that part right there, verse number 3. Um, there in your Bible, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Verse 4, they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. The night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. And they, so right there when it says they will reign, that's speaking of you and I as, as Christians, as believers, we will be reigning with the Lord forever and ever. We're going to look at that here in just a second. And so here's some of the motivations. We're going to look at basically, if you're taking note, seven motivations, okay, that I'm going to be pointing out of our destination, right? And so again, uh, some of that, so motivation number one, and let's look at verse number one here, guys. And, and I want, to, want us to notice, um, he says that he noticed uh, uh, the angel shows him, uh, the angel showed me the river of the water of life, brightest crystal flowing from the throne of God. Listen, this, this really stuck out to me. You know, um, this river, what is, it is, uh, it's a river of life. It's bright and it's flowing from the throne, right? It's, it's, uh, it's flowing, it's crystal, it's bright as crystal. It's a river of life and flowing from the throne. So Again, some of your translations say you know, this is a pure river, this flowing river. Now, there are many places in the Bible when you look and you go through the word of God that, that you know, talks about flowing water as being a, a blessing. And so the Bible speaks of flowing water or rivers or streams, uh, streams of water as, as major blessings. One of, the, one of the major blessings are one of the verses I really enjoy that when I think of this is in Psalm chapter number one and where the psalmist describes the, the man, you know, a, a man who's dedicated to over to the Lord and his word. Now listen, this is what it says. Psalm one verses one through three. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of of scoffers, watch this, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Here's the verse right here. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, in all that he does he prospers. And so a person who desires to seek the Lord is like this tree that's planted by the water. Now, when I think of this, I think of this, you know, this person who's, you know, I love the illustration that the Bible always says, man, that man is like a tree, a solid tree, but notice where he's planted, right? And, and there the psalmist says that this man is planted by the streams of water. And, and friends, listen, we all know that, that a, a tree, that, it, you know, it's, it gets this nourishment. And when it's, when it's watered, you know, and it's got these, uh, and when it's watered, you know, diligently and it's healthy and the leaves are going to sprout, its fruit is going to be sweet, everything's going to be there. You see the importance of this water. You know, there was a, a while back ago, my family and I, we went to uh, Yosemite camping. This is something that we used to do. And, and I know if my family's watching right now, they're like, man, we got to get back to camping like that. That was fun. I really loved it. But I remember um, this one early morning I had gotten up and I actually went through this verse and uh, right there by the, by the little river stream. And as I read this verse, I, I looked up and I noticed the trees that were there in Yosemite that were planted by this, by the, by the, you know, by the stream. I think it was the Kern River that flows through there. And, um, and there was one particular tree that was, man, the roots were like coming up out of the ground, but then they were going back like into like the banks of that little river stream right there. And I looked up at this tree and it, man, it was huge. It was thick. It was green. The leaves were, were big and it just really, um, ministered to me the importance of that tree being planted right there where it's at in the roots 
going down deep into like the banks of this stream. Guys, when we see this, and I think of chapter 22 in the beginning, right here in verse number one, this, this flow of water, this stream of water, it is, it is flowing, it is clear, and it's going to the throne, it's coming from the throne of God, as it says, right? And it's a river of life. We just sang a song about that. I got a river of life flowing out. Okay, I'm not going to sing right? But the river of life, this is so important for us to understand that this is what Jesus wants from us. What he wants to do in us is have this river of life flowing out of us. Now, real quick, I want to make sure because there's a lot of other passages that, that from, there's a passage in Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 14. If you're taking note, you can write that down, Zechariah chapter 14, as well as in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter number 47, that speak of a river, right? They speak of a river, but that river that's, uh, that, that uh, Zechariah and both Ezekiel are speaking of is during the, the millennial reign of Christ, now, remember, this is after the millennial. Chapter 22, this is not the millennial reign of Christ. This is eternity. This is as we, you know, as we are going to see it here in this river of life. So this river, guys, this river, what does it speak to us? This river speaks to us. Um, this river is any, it's in eternity, okay? And it speaks of power, okay? This river speaks of power, of purity, and of eternal life, and of eternal life, power, purity, and eternal life. Again, notice where this river begins. It begins from God, right? It says here, it says flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb. I think that's very important that it's not just the throne of God, but end of the lamb. And we know the lamb, the lamb that was slain, that is Jesus Christ. Right, so we need. It's very important that we notice where this river is, the source of this river, where it begins, the throne of God and the Lamb. Now, I can't help but think of Jesus's interaction with the woman at the well. Okay, in the Gospel of John, in chapter number fourteen, guys, and so write that down in your notes. Okay, in the Gospel of John, chapter number fourteen, Jesus and his disciples—they are, you know, they're they're on this journey, and they were. And see, something that was crazy is that uh, the Jews, instead of going through with like a shortcut, which would be going through the land of Samaria. The, oftentimes they would go around because, well, they wouldn't have anything to do with the Samaritans. But gee, I love Jesus, man, because every time Jesus does something, there's a plan. Jesus has a plan. And I believe that even today, the, the stuff that we're going through, the stuff that you're going through, okay, Jesus has a plan in it. And sometimes we don't understand the plan because even the disciples, you know, they were, they were going to go around and I believe they're on their way to Bethany and, and, but they were going to take the long route. And Jesus says, no, let's go through Samaria. And the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. Like, why are you, you want to go through Samaria? This doesn't make sense. We don't do this. But they follow Jesus, which is something that we need to do. Because there's a lot of times, my friends, listen, that we're, we're journeying through our life. We're going through stuff in our life. We don't understand what Jesus is doing. But it's necessary and it's important that we follow Jesus. Right? You just keep following what the Lord is doing. Okay? So the disciples, they didn't understand. They didn't get a clue what Jesus was doing. They didn't know that Jesus had a plan. Well, as they get there to Samaria, in the middle of the day, Jesus, he goes to this well, right, to go and get some water in the middle of the day. And as he goes there in the middle of the day, he's met there by a woman, right? And this woman there is a, she's a woman from Samaria. And then Jesus just begins to strike up a conversation, you know, like, hey, what's going on? What's happening? You know, and, and he just strikes this conversation. Well, long story short, guys, in, in chapter number four, I want you to read it because it's fascinating. It's amazing because we see the plan of God there. This woman, basically, Jesus is beginning to reveal himself, right, as a source of life, as, as Savior, as the Messiah to her. And Jesus, I love it because Jesus says, hey, okay, why don't you go get your husband? He calls her out. 
He calls her out because I think sometimes God, that's what he does. He calls us out because he wants us to recognize areas in our life that, that we need to make right with him. And so he calls her out and he says, hey, why don't you go get your husband and come back? And then she stops and she says, I, well, I don't have a husband, you know. And basically she was just shacking up with some dude, right, and, and, and living in fornication, Jesus didn't condemn her. It's like, oh, how dare you? You know, you're going to hell. He didn't say that. He say, he basically, he says, you know what? You're right. You know, you're right. And, and, and he says, he begins to tell her about himself, about the thirst that she had. Listen to this verse. I want to read it to you. It's verse cha chapter 4. So that story is out of chapter number 4. And I'm going to read verses 13 and 14. Jesus basically says this. He says to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Now, he's speaking of, you know, again, as a, a lesson there because they were getting water from the well. And so Jesus says, whoever drinks from this well is going to be thirsty again. But, he says, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You know, and at that moment, man, the woman is like, oh, man, sir, give me this. Give me this water. That's what I want. See, Jesus is this living water. And again, going back over here to Revelation in chapter number 22, as we see here the, the flowing, this, this crystal clear flowing river is coming not just from the throne, but from the Lord. And that's who Jesus is. He gives us, see, every single one of us, we have this thirst in us. And Jesus and his love and his grace, out of him, he quenches that thirst. And well, we see it in, in, in John chapter 4, but we also see it here in Revelation in chapter 22 and verse number 1. So the first motivation, right, um, if you will, of our destination. So the first motivation of our destination, the flowing river, the crystal clear flowing river from God, from the throne. Now, number two, the number two motivation, the tree of life. Now, there's a similar tree that's mentioned to us in the book of Genesis in chapter number three, because uh, it says there, in notice in verse number two, and, and through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So this tree of, so motivation number two. The tree of life. Again, back in Genesis, we are introduced to a very similar, if not the same tree of life. Let me read it for you. This is what it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse, starting at verse 22. It says this. Then the Lord God said, now remember, this is after Adam and Eve had eaten the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And their eyes were open that they were naked. You know, they, they, they had sinned. They had rebelled against the Lord and, and everything. And it says this. Then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take all also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken, which was one of the curses. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. Okay, and so there was those two trees that were there in the Garden of Eden, the, gar the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the, tree of the, and the tree of life. Well, the tree of life here, God is protecting it now, right? And he's like, hey, lest, let, lest they begin to eat this and, and eat, live forever, you know, we got to guard it, right? But here we see in chapter 22 of Revelation, verse number two, this tree, it is there. Now, the river, guys, listen, the river and the tree picture for us an abundant life, okay? The river and the tree, they picture for us an abundant life, a long life, a life of eternity. Now, remember, sin, sin had prevented Adam and Eve from enjoying this 
abundant life. Okay, now it says, you know, the, some of the curse there that, that for Eve was that they, she was going to have pain and childbearing, right? And, and for Adam, you know, from the sweat of his brow was now going to be, you know, a hard labor, right? Um, and, and everything and all the other curses that came along with it, the thorns and the, and the bushes and all those things. Well, because of sin, all the, the curse had come into the world in that sense, but they were prevented, Adam and Eve, they were prevented from experiencing this kind of abundant eternal life. But here's the wonderful thing, you know, but Jesus, right? But Jesus, because you and I, we were kind of in the same boat at one point, you know, when, when we were rebelling against God, when we didn't live a life honoring to the Lord or, or submitted to his leadership and his goodness, you know, and his mercy or his grace, we were rebellious. And we, we did not experience the abundant life that God has for us. Now, I think here as Christians here, we get a glimpse of that abundant life, right? We, we are born again. Right? As, as born-again believers, we, we think differently. There's a renewing of our mind. I don't do the things that I used to do. I don't, you know, even though I'm challenged with my thought life, even though I'm challenged with my flesh and everything, I understand that if I go to Jesus and the power of his Holy Spirit, he's going to help me. That's just the grace of God. It's the grace of God in all of this. Right? So, but Jesus, so, but because of what Jesus did, and, and how Jesus and what he did by forgiving us of all of our sin when we repent, we are then promised, we are promised an abundant life, right? Not just here, again, we get to experience this, we get to experience this here on earth, but we have this ultimate promise to be in heaven, to experience the abundant life, the flowing river, the tree of life. Again, a picture of abundance, Man, our hearts just being blessed. I love what Jesus says in the Gospel of John in chapter number 10. In verse number 10, you guys know this. I, I quote this scripture often because, you know, it, it's just, man, it's just, well, for me, it's very powerful. It's kind of black and white, very simple. What the devil wants, but yet what God wants for us. The devil, what he wants is to rob, steal, and kill. Listen to what the Bible verse says. That John chapter 10, verse 10 says this. The thief, speaking of the devil, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's it. All right? Hey, that's it. Kill, steal, and destroy. That's what he's here for. But Jesus says, I have, I have come, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. You see, and that's the whole purpose of why Jesus came into this world, to give us life, a new life, a life promised of, a promise of eternity forever. And that's the purpose of why Jesus came. But I love there in verse number 10, what I, one of the things I love about it is that he just doesn't, Jesus just doesn't say, I have come to give you life. He says life abundantly. Not just life, but an abundant life, a better life, more than what we can ask or think. And those are some of the promises of God. And I want you to think about this, friends. Listen, we're not in heaven yet. You know, in this, this undisturbed presence of God, that's what heaven's going to be like, right? But we have glimpses of that. And here today in this life that we get to have, you know, it's, it's, a, it's different, it's transformed. And yeah, we have our challenges, but yet at the same time, it is abundant. We can say it's abundant. It is so much better than what my life was before. And that's what Jesus gives to us. And again, I just think that's a, a picture or, or an, an illustration of the grace and the mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, the idea, guys, as we look back here at chapter 22 and verse number 2, the idea of the leaves healing the nations or, or the people. Remember, I spoke about this last week that the word nations can also be translated, uh, maybe better translated as Gentiles, right, or the people. And so the, the idea of the healing um, from the leaves is the enjoyment of life in the new Jerusalem. Now, 
see, some can read this verse right here and say, well, it, does that mean that there's going to, there's, there's a need for healing, you know, there in heaven that people are going to have, you know, be, be sick and ill and all this other stuff. No, 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 not at all. In, in the same way that remember uh, in the chapter that we were in before chapter 21, where, where Jesus, where the Bible tells us that, um, that Jesus will wipe away all of the tears, Right there in the presence of God in heaven and in eternity, it doesn't mean that that you know there's going to be tears of sorrow uh, or anything like that in heaven. The idea is you know those those experiences that from you know from uh, the old earth, right? All those experiences that bring pain and heartache and and sorrow and the need for healing is going to be gone. It's not going to be so. Every tear is going to be wiped away. In other words, it ain't gonna, you ain't going to see no tears of sorrow. You know, maybe perhaps tears of joy because I, you know, I don't know. I maybe no tears because it says all the tears will be wiped away. But you know, those those joyful tears are all sometimes um, fun to uh, fun to express, right? But. That, that's the idea behind that verse right there. So it doesn't mean that there's going to be any kind of illness or anything like that. You know, it's just the, the picture of that, um, the enjoyment of life, this new life in Jerusalem. Okay, so uh, motivation number one is the, the stream, right? The river, right? Motivation number two, the tree of life. Motivation number three, oh, guys, listen, is the presence of God that dispels all curses, that's motivation number three. Look at verse three. It says, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. And motivation number three, the presence of God dispels all curses. Now, what is the curse? What is the curse? Okay. Now, in this context, and I want us to understand this, the curse is sin, right? The curse is sin. And what... What is the wages of sin? The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. Okay, so the curse of sin is death. And, but now here's the thing. Now that sin and evil is done with, there will be the pure presence of God. We have to understand something, guys. And I'm sure that many of us understand this, is that what separates man from God is sin. Okay, it is sin. And that was the whole purpose of why God sent his son, right, to be the mediator between man and God, that through Jesus, we get to have a relationship with God. Okay, it is through Jesus, right? Jesus, remember, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but through me. That's in the gospel of John chapter 14, verse number six. And so sin, and again, so if we look at verse number three, no longer will there be, will there, there be anything accursed. Why? Because sin is done away with. Sin is gone. Man, guys, Verse number three, yesterday when I was going through this, I remember I got up, I was like, God, this is going to be amazing. No more sin. No more carnality, right? And no, no more of all this stuff that you and I wrestle with, because I know you wrestle with stuff, right? I know you wrestle with sin. I know you wrestle with your flesh, with the things of this world, all the things that want to pull us away from God. Well, all those things are going to be gone, and we're, there's just going to be the pure presence of God. It's going to be amazing, the pure presence of God, right? Again, it's, what, it's, it's the sin that separates man from God. But in, in our eternal destination, right, sin is not present. Sin is not present. So, man, isn't that a good motivation right there? Man, no sin there in heaven, okay? Now, motivation number four, as we look at this here, adding to the motivation um, there in the same verse of verse number three, adding to this uh, motivation number four is that we are going to worship him. In other words, uh, I love what it says here. It says, his servants will worship him, right? And his servants will worship him. Now, some of your translations might say your servants will serve him. Um, I, I like this translation here in, in the ESV that it says your servants will worship him um, because our service, okay, to the Lord, you know, and his servants will serve him again, as I said, is an act of worship. At least it ought to be. 
our service, your service to Jesus should be this act of worship. And so adding to this motivation, we saints as believers, we will worship the Lord in our service, right? Again, the motivation of our, and I hope and pray this, guys. I hope and pray that many of you say that you want to serve the Lord, okay? Now, I know that when I say this, sometimes there's an idea, there's a thought for, for many Christians that say, well, if I say I want to serve the Lord, that means I want to be at church all the time or I'm going to be a, become a, a, a pastor or something like that. That's not necessarily the case. It may be for some of you. And that's a good thing. I I think that's a a, a good thing to desire is to be a servant of the Lord in the house of God, right? Those are, you know, even the Bible tells us those are good desires to have. But we serve the Lord in our daily life. At least that's the mindset that you and I ought to have as Christians is that, you know, every day I want to serve the Lord. Whether it's, you know, in my home or at my workplace, with my local community, with my neighbors, I might, this is an act of service to the Lord, right? And so our motivation uh, to our acts of service should always be in a way that it's an act of worship, right? It's an act of worship. I'm, I'm, I'm dying to myself. Now, this is what it, you know, worship, remember guys, as I mentioned before, worship, you know, requires a lot of, sac- you know, here on this side of heaven is sacrifice, right? I'm giving up of myself. Well, when we're there in heaven, this act of worship is going to, there's not going to be any desire to sacrifice. It's going to be a willingness. It's going to be this enjoyment, right? To want to serve the Lord. And we're, this is something that we're going to be doing all the time. Now, listen, this, it will be a perfect worship. It'll be a perf- perfect worship and service to our Lord. What does that mean? A perfect worship and perfect service to our Lord. Well, this is what it means today. Again, as this side of heaven, our worship and our service to the Lord, it's handicapped. All right. Our worship, remember, okay, these acts of service and our, our ministry, or if, 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 if you will, to the Lord today on this side of heaven, it is handicapped. Handicapped with sin and weakness. You and I both know it. I deal with it. You know, it's like, man, I, I, I have, you know, Jesus even says it to his disciples when Jesus called, you know, Peter, James, and John, and he was about to, you know, be met with an arrest and go to the cross. And he tells the three guys, hey, man, I want you guys meant to pray, pray with me, you know? And they were probably like, okay, well, let's go and pray, right? But they fell asleep. You guys know the story. And what did Jesus come and say? You know, he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. They were handicapped with their flesh, with their carnality, with their weakness, you see. And you and I, we have that same thing. We're handicapped today, it seems, you know, because how many times have I heard people say, how many times have I myself have said, man, I feel like I want to go do things, but I'm tired. I'm tired. Man, I'm done. I, you know, I don't know if I want to go to church today. I don't know if I want to go to that prayer meeting. I don't know if I want to do all this. Why? Because while we look to self, right? We look to self. Man, that just proves to us people, friends, that we are selfish people, man. We're, we, we, we're selfish human beings, right? Because we think of self. And, you know, we're tired. We don't feel well, you know. And, and, you know, or maybe it's like, you know, I don't know if I want to go because, well, that person said this the last time I was there. And, you know, and all, it's just like man, all the drama, all the stuff, guys. On this side of heaven today, we're handicapped with with sin, with weakness, with our carnality, with our selfishness, right? And that's why I say like, you know, like on this side of heaven, our acts of worship, it requires sacrifice. It requires a denial of self. But think of it. Okay, just think of it here, verse number three, chapter 22, here, as it says, man, you know, the presence of God is going to be there. There's going to be no more curse. It's going to be gone. No sin, right? None of that stuff is going to be there. The presence of God, but the throne of God and the lamb will be in it. The complete, pure presence of God doing away with all that sin. And it says, and... His servants, as you and me, we're going to be in heaven, man. 
can, can you smile right now and say, I'm going to be in heaven? I heard you. All right. That's good. I'm going to be in heaven. And check it out. When we're in heaven, we are going to freely, without any handicaps, well, without any selfishness, right, without any weaknesses, we are going to serve and worship the Lord. It's going to be perfect. We're not going to be handicapped. My friends, the motivation of our destination is that all hindrances will be gone. Can I get an amen for that one? Man, this was like really getting me excited yesterday. I don't know if you can tell right now if I'm excited about it, but when I'm in heaven, all the hindrances are going to be gone. Have you guys ever done this? Check, check it out. This has happened to me. Have you ever been like in a prayer meeting and you're like, you're into it, right? You're into it. It's like, oh, I'm so glad we're praying. And, and maybe even the Lord has given you a couple of verses to share with the group. And you're like, man, I can't wait. The, all of a sudden you're praying, you're praying in the spirit, right? The Lord is ministering to you and, and you're praying, you know, and it's like, man, God, this is amazing. And then all of a sudden that weird thought runs through your brain. You know what I mean? That is like, and, and, and then all of a sudden, you're like, you're like thinking that thought. That thought is on the forefront of your mind, right? And then, hey, it's like, this is what I've done. I'm like, oh my, I have to shake my head. Like, what the heck am I thinking about? I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to talk about Jesus. I want to, I want to, I want my mind to be wrapped around him. Guys, I will confess this to you, Right? Don't tell nobody. <laughs> Here it is. There's been times when I've been actually preaching behind the pulpit, like right here, right now, where as I'm preaching, a thought goes in my head, you know? And this is like, what? And I have to like, what am I? At the same time as I'm talking, I'm thinking like, okay, I have to bring it right back in here. You see? And it's starting, it's starting to happen right now. So pray for me. <laughs> I'm just teasing, man. But listen, that just goes to show how weak we can be at times in heaven and there's not going to be any of that. All the hindrances, all the handicaps, all the weaknesses, all the challenges, all the sickness, all the tear, all the sorrow, it is going to be gone. It's going to be, it's not going to exist there. Why? Because there's going to be the the, the perfect presence of our Lord and Savior is going to be there. You see, this perfect service in this perfect destination, man, friends, it's going to be amazing. May that be a, a, a motivation that keeps us even today. May that be a motivation for today, right, on this side of heaven, with all the weaknesses, with all the hindrances and all the handicaps that we may have in life, may the motivation, the thought of, you know what, one day it's not going to be like this. And so, you know what, I want to stay faithful to this as much as I can today and the best that I can. And friends, the way that you and I stay faithful today is by being reliant on the power of God's Holy Spirit. That's how you and I can stay faithful today, by you and I being reliant, subjected to, desiring for God, the Holy Spirit, to empower me to be, to be and stay faithful to those little things here on earth as we know it today. It's amazing. I love it. Motivation number five, right here. We will see him clearly. Look at as as it says right there in verse number four. Motivation number five. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. They will see you. Will, we will see the face of God, face to face with our Lord and Savior. Motivation number five. We will see him clearly. Nothing. Nothing will hinder us from seeing Jesus. You know, that's going to be one of the most amazing things. You know, I, every time, you know, I, I think of this or even when I, when I um, do a memorial service and officiate a memorial service and, and for, for that of a believer, right? For someone who's in, uh, who was a faithful Christian who believed in Jesus, 
I always think of like, you know, this person is not here, but the Bible tells us to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. And that just tells me that that saint, that believer in Jesus Christ is face to face with his maker, is face to face with Jesus you know, and, and man, guys, I seriously, seriously, when I, when I think on this and I ponder it, I just think of Jesus, man, just having this big old giant cheeseburger smile, just like, man, you know, when I get to heaven, he'd be like, man, what's up, Tommy, what's up? Just give me a big old hug, you know, and, and I just, and, and man, it's amazing to see Jesus clearly. Motivation number five, nothing was going to hinder us from seeing Jesus. And not only that, my friends, his name, I love it. His name, it says his name will be on our foreheads, right? His name is going to be on us. What does that look like? I heard someone say, is that going to be that we're going to have tattoos? I don't know. Maybe, who knows? It's going to be a nice tattoo though. That's for sure, <laughs> right? If it is, but his name, so his name on us, it, that speaks that we belong to him, that speaks that we belong to him. Guys, if you remember back in Revelation in chapter number seven in verse number three, I'll read it for you. This is what it says. Now, remember, this is uh, the 144,000. This was like before, you know, all the, the bulls and, and, you know, the, the Trump before, uh, right after the uh, seals were opened, right? This is what the Bible tells us. After this, in chapter number seven, you might remember this because we went through this. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against the tree. Verse two. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun and the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea. This is during the time of the tribulation. This is what the angel says. Watch this. He's in verse number three. He says this, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees. Watch this until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. You see here, the angels like wait for those during the time of the tribulation. They need to be sealed. They need to be identified as belonging to God. So before these, before any harm happens to the earth and the sea, the earth and the trees, all that stuff, we, they need to be sealed. In other words, identified as belonging to God, belonging to Christ. And there in eternity, we are going to see Jesus clearly and we are going to be identified in the name his name will be on us in other words again as i mentioned we belong to him listen to what this passage says in first corinthians okay first corinthians chapter number six verse number 19 and 20 this is what it says do this the apostle paul writes this and he says this do you not know that your body is a temple of the holy spirit within you whom you have from god you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You are not your own. Hello. You, are, you, you, you belong to God. Your body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Remember the temple there in the, in the New Testament, that would be the, the dwelling place, the tabernacle, if you will, looking at the Old Testament. Right, And God would take up residence there in the tabernacle or in the temple. But when Jesus came into this world and he died on the cross, the veil was torn from top to bottom. That means that you and I have this free access to God and we have a relationship with God. And when we confess our sin, what happens is that God takes up residence in us. This is why Paul says your body, your body, your person is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You don't belong to yourself. He says you were bought at a price. Think of the price that was paid for us. Think of the price that was paid for you. God's, God, he, he paid it all. He paid it all. We owed it, we owed it all, but he paid it all by sending his son on the cross to die for us. Now, I want just let that resonate just for a quick second because what did I ever do to deserve the grace of God for him to send his son to die and to be massacred the way that he was on a cross, to be mocked, God in the flesh spit upon, and he did it for me. 
He did it for you. That just speaks to us as how much God values us. Guys, I want you to know that God values you. He cherishes you. He loves you. And we here, you know, as we see this, motivation number five is that, you know, we, we belong to him and that we will see him clearly, right? Now let's take a look at motivations number six and seven here as says in verse number five, and night, here is all the presence of God, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. No more light, man. This, guys, this is, this is awesome. Motivations number six and seven. Number six, Jesus illuminates. Number seven, saints will rule with Jesus. We will rule with Jesus, right? And so number six here, Jesus illuminates. Jesus illuminating is a great reminder that Jesus brightens our life. He brightens our life. And I'm going to get back to that in just a second. You know, okay, so how Jesus brightens our life and he just lights our life up. But not only that, guys, again, motivation num number seven there is that we're going to reign. We're going to rule and reign with the Lord. You see, a lot of times people think that, oh, what's going to, is it going to be boring in heaven? You know, what are we going to, are we going to do, what are we going to do in heaven? Like, man, it's just, are we going to sit on a cloud with like a, a little, you know, um, a sheet around us, you know, um, and, and play a little harp or something like that and look like a baby? The answer is no, <laughs> we're not going to do that. They're, we're going to rule and reign. Remember, there's going to be the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, right? And, and even as the Bible was saying there in verse number three at the end, we are going to worship him or we are going to serve him, right? And here, we're going, oh, we're going to also reign. And all of this is, you know, depending upon the will of God, right? Where, where God is going to have us rule and reign with him. But these are motivations, guys. Motiv our destination of where we are going to be ought to serve as a motivation for my life today to live it faithfully. And it's not easy. <laughs> it ain't easy. I get it. It is difficult. But let's take a look here as we close, as I mentioned, how Jesus illuminates. Motivation number six. This Jesus illuminating, again, reminds reminds us, at least it ought to remind us, that Jesus brightens up our life. There's nothing that Jesus, Jesus a part of anybody's life will not make that life darker. Never, never, ever, ever will that happen. Jesus a part of a person's life always brightens that person's life up. Okay, now it doesn't mean that that person's life is going to just be, you know, um, like, like uh, you know, all, e all easy, you know, with whipped cream and a cherry on top. It just don't work that way. We all know that. But yet, Jesus brightens that life up. In the Gospel of John in chapter 8, verse number, tw verse number 12, Jesus says this of himself. He says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. I know I shared this verse last week. Jesus is the light of the world. And here there's going to be no sun. And again, as it says right there in verse number five, you know, there's not going to be any need for light or, or, or the sun or anything like that. For the Lord God will be their light. God will illuminate. God will brighten up. That's what he does. Maybe today you feel like maybe your life's in a little bit of darkness. Maybe you feel like your life is in a bit of a shadow, right? Or maybe you feel like, you know, my life has been in the light, but now there's an eclipse and there's like, I, I can't find the light. You know, there's an eclipse right there. I want you to know that Jesus, he brightens up our lives when you totally, completely surrender to him. That's what he does. That's his love and that's his grace. So I want to ask you, what motivates you today? 
Heaven, my friends, is a reality for us. It's a reality for us who are saved. Heaven is very real. And that, I pray, would motivate us. The destination of heaven is a motivation for all of us to live holy, we can say, right? Now, remember, the word, when I say holy, it doesn't mean to live perfectly. It means, you know, to live a surrendered life, right? A, a sanctified life, a, 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 a life that is separated from, the, from my flesh and the world. And that's hard to do because we live in the world and we have flesh on. And it's, we have all these weaknesses, as I mentioned earlier. But if there's a heart's desire to do that, God will give us the empowerment to do so. And I want to thank God. I thank the Lord that he doesn't leave it all up to us, right? He doesn't leave it all on our shoulders like, all right, man, now go figure it out, knucklehead. He, you know, he doesn't do that. He loves us so much that God is gracious to give us the helper, right? Remember Jesus, he even said, hey, it is important. It is imperative. I, I have to go because if I don't go, the helper won't come. And the helper, the Paracletus. God, God, the Holy Spirit coming alongside us to help us to live this sanctified life. God, the Holy Spirit to help us to stay motivated, right? To stay motivated, you know, as, as I seek and pursue the things of God. And friends, let me tell you something. I get it. It ain't easy. I know it's not easy. But God. God is so gracious that he gives to us his son, that if we believe in him and confess our sin to him, we then have the promise of heaven, right? Our, we, the, our destination, and that destination can in turn be, is and should be a motivation for us to say, I want to live a sanctified life now. I want to live a life that's transformed and changed all by the grace and glory of God. And, it's, and we, need a re, we need to rely on his Holy Spirit to do so. And so right now I'm going to pray. And maybe you feel like, as I mentioned, you're, you're just in these places, you know, all just the, you know, you, maybe you haven't been motivated lately. Maybe you just, you know, kind of just been down in the dumps. You're like, ah, I'm really not motivated. Even though, even though I get the phone calls from church family, even though I get the emails or the alerts or this or that, ah, I'm, 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 not, I'm not motivated. Well, I want to encourage you to rely on God's Holy Spirit if you're not motivated and you know that you want to be motivated, you ask God, the Holy Spirit, ask God, God, fill me with your spirit. And remember, on this side of heaven, we have weaknesses, we have challenges, and there is that sin that kind of just pulls us away. And I think it's just identifying on this side of heaven, it's identifying the weakness it's saying, yes, I, I struggle with this. I battle with that. It's identifying, you know, sin or the, the things that, that, that are easily, you know, pulling you away. Identifying it, confessing it, repenting it, repenting of it, and asking God to help you to stay centered, to stay, to stay the course, if you will. So let me pray for you. God, Lord, we love you, and we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit and, and the grace and mercy of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And God, I thank you that, that our destination of heaven as a believer in Jesus Christ can serve and does serve as a motivation for us to say, I, I really do want to live a life that's bringing glory to God. Lord, on this side of heaven, there's those challenges. However, on this side of heaven, Lord, those, there's those, those weaknesses that we battle with. And I'm asking, Father, that if, if, if there's those weaknesses and those challenges that, that your people are really, truly battling with, Lord, would you reveal your grace to them, that you love them and that you have the power of the Holy Spirit to pour into them, to lead them through all of that? And right now, if that's you, if that's you, and you're like, man, I, I'm struggling, I, I, I'm battling, I, I don't know if I am motivated, but you want to be, right now, wherever you, if you're by yourself, or if you're with a small group, or whatever, whatever it is that you're doing, I want you to just stand to your feet right now. 
Just stand to your feet and say, God, I don't want to be distracted, but I, I, I want to be motivated. Just stand to your feet. If you're, if you're feeling like you're embarrassed to stand to your feet, I want you to know that's part of our weakness. Die to that weakness and just stand to your feet. Father, you see those that are standing to their feet right now. And I pray, God, that you, Lord, would hear the cry of their heart and that you would fill them with the power of your Holy Spirit, with the grace of your Holy Spirit, with the love and the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, in their hearts. And if you are standing, I would ask you to repeat this simple prayer just to say these words from the, from the, from the bottom of your heart. Very simple. Say this, help me, Jesus. Fill me with your spirit. Amen.